So, Dave, great to have you here. Great to be here. So, Dave, who are you? So, Dave Brown, I lead the EC2 organization. That's the Elastic Compute Cloud. Um, I've been on that team now for a little over 15 years. So I started out as a, an engineer writing code in the very early days of EC2 and kind of just stuck around and uh, have the privilege of leading the team, which is all our compute and networking services at AWS. Can I say that you have been a fantastic partner? Thank you. Since I joined AWS, yeah? It's been a lot of fun. To Loved uh, you spending this proportionate time following our customers in Telco. Absolutely. Especially along the digital sovereignty thing. So, Dave, um, I see in the blog, what is that AWS is saying in our blog around digital sovereignty? Yeah, so, we, so we've been looking at digital sovereignty, honestly, in a lot of detail for about the last three years in earnest. But I really take our digital sovereignty story all the way back to 2008. And so it's been something we've been focusing on for a long, long time. Uh, in the early days, we maybe didn't even realize we were doing it. We were really optimizing for security and availability. But those have all become such critical things when you start thinking about digital sovereignty. So <clears throat> about six months ago, we put out a blog um, called our Digital Sovereignty Pledge, um, which really says that AWS uh, is going to be sovereign by design. That's what we're going for. We want to make sure that what we bring from a digital sovereignty and a data sovereignty point of view um, still gives customers the richness of the cloud, the functionality of the cloud, gives them control over their data, which, as I said earlier, isn't far off from what we've been doing since the very early days of AWS. But the, the blog post really outlines how we're approaching the, the challenge um, and how we're looking to solve it on behalf of our customers. Now, super interesting. And, you know, I found uh, really insightful having conversations with you, with our customers. So should you recap which are the key tenets uh, that we have used shaping our approach to digital sovereignty along the years. I mean, you have been here since ever. Yeah. So which have been the key decisions that made us uh, sovereign by design? I think, you know, one of the very early decisions that we took, uh, as I said, was back in 2008. And at the time, people were still trying to get their head around the cloud. Like, is the cloud going to work? You know, are we going to be able to move our data centers to the cloud? <laughs> is that actually going to work for us? Um, and middle of 2008, uh, we actually had an event uh, with S3. And S3 was one of the very early AWS services. EC2 was only in our US East 1 region. There were no other regions. And S3 actually had an event. It was a Sunday afternoon. I remember it well. Um, and uh, you can still go read about it today if you search on the internet for July 2008 AWS. Um, but what happened is we actually had, uh, S3 used to share uh, information between three locations. So Virginia, Seattle, and Dublin. And when you created a new file in S3 or object in S3, it would actually use the thing called the gossip protocol. It would actually gossip between those three locations. And we had a router on the east coast of the US that would just flip a bit every now and then. It was a broken router. We didn't know it was broken. And over a period of a few hours, S3 started to tell everybody that the file didn't exist because this key store that it was gossiping about became uh, unavailable. And the way we fixed it, as you fix everything, is we turned it off and back on again. And that recovered S3, right, for that day. But what we were doing at the same time was we were trying to design what the second region for EC2 would look like, and ultimately for AWS. And that was going to be Dublin. And prior to that event, we thought everything was going to be just one big global cloud, very similar to what all of the other cloud providers do today, right? We a lot of uh, functionality is centralized and a lot of the other regions will continue to use that. And we came into the office on that Monday and we said we have to completely change our strategy because if we are sharing data between regions, we cannot guarantee that those regions won't fail for the same reason at the same time. And what was amazing about that decision is it's meant over the years we've actually built our regions to be very, very isolated. So when we put down a new region, like we just put a region in Melbourne a couple of weeks back, we did Switzerland, we've done yeah in Spain recently as well. Those regions are complete AWS footprints of a region. And so it allows our customers, or you fast forward to today, and from a digital or data sovereignty point of view, customers know that the services that they're using and the data that they're storing is always going to be local to that region and that geography. And so it aligns very well um, with what regulators have been looking for. Amazing. I think uh, these are the key milestones that you need to go through while you scale managing complexity. I think that is one of the reasons why we say that there is no compression algorithm to experience, right? Yeah. You need to clash against the wall sometimes to listen and to understand. And that's even been true today in how we think about digital sovereignty, right? And, and one of the reasons we went out with a pledge and not a solution, we've seen others come out with solutions, is very, it's very hard to come out with a one solution because 
we have to look at you know what how is a country or a regulator in the case of telco maybe defining digital sovereignty and how does that fit with what AWS has to provide what do we have to do to innovate on behalf of our customer what is our customer going to have to do and how are they going to have to change and maybe in some cases regulators change as well as they learn about you know, services on our side, like Nitro, for example, and just the level of data protection that that provides, we've even seen regulators change some of the strategy when they really understand what we do from a security point of view. So it's a journey. It's not just checking tick boxes, but yeah. the pledge really says that AWS is committed to providing digital sovereignty for our customers. In an ever-changing world, that's changing faster than we've ever seen it change before, we're committed to working with our customers, working with regulators, and bringing our richness of services into these regulated environments. Again, for me, it was amazing one month ago when we spent that one week just traveling Europe yeah. with you listening to regulators and customers. Um, what is that you have learned in this very intense interaction that you have had in the last months? Yeah. I think the first thing to acknowledge is, you know, digital sovereignty is definitely something that, uh, you know, is very important to countries. And it's not something that we, anybody should be writing off. There's a very clear reason as to why they want digital sovereignty and why they need sovereignty and digital data sovereignty as a country. Um, the second thing is I think there's still uh, you know, a lot of uncertainty out there as to exactly what's going to be required and how that's going to work. And as AWS, we're really working very hard to bring a lot of clarity into these situations. Um, in many cases, that's happening behind the scenes. Um, you know, we're working very closely with regulators. Um, uh, and again, as I said earlier, it's, it's really you know, empathizing, understanding what they're trying to do, and then trying to make sure that the cloud solutions we have solve, the, solve the, uh, the outcome that they're looking for, but also educate them in the way that the cloud works. And yeah. so it's, it's very much us innovating, regulators understanding what we have, and then ultimately delivering what the customer needs. And it's also working closely with our customers and ISVs and telcos, right? In many cases, we have customers that are owning part of the digital sovereignty experience for their end customer as well, right? The customer's gonna be using the telco in a certain country. And so, you know, together with, you know, our technologies, like our regions, our local zones, even our outposts, all bring certain types um, of digital so sovereignty solutions that customers can deploy. Ah, great to hear. Um, you know, you mentioned Nitro as a, let me say, a moment of innovation where we reinvented the hypervisor technology, essentially, having sovereignty in mind, yeah. can I say that? Yeah. Now, should you mention the key functionality and control functions that we can provide today to our customers to be compliant with the, the most stringent requirements in terms of digital sovereignty, what would you say? Yeah. Well, actually, that's another key milestone for us, right? I spoke about availability, about regions and isolation earlier. But Nitro was probably one of, you know, it has to be the next massive step we took. Um, at the time, digital sovereignty, again, we were designing for security and availability. Uh, we were designing very much for data separation to ensure that us as a cloud provider don't have access to customer data or can't gain access to customer data. And so when we, you know, we initially started off designing Nitro to really solve some of the latency problems we were seeing. And then when we got to designing all parts of the system and rethinking how the hypervisor worked, we started to think about, well, you know, how do we make sure that we just have a level of security here that would never have been achievable um, with a software-based hypervisor? And you know, even you know, first Nitro instance, the very first Nitro instance launched in 2012, and the full 100% Nitro instance where every single part of that machine used Nitro as its system was launched in 2017. And today we're still the only cloud provider that has anything like Nitro. That's amazing. But from a security point of view, it's a very strong separation between AWS and customer data. Um, all customer data is encrypted at rest with a key that exists only for the lifetime of the instance and it's never known to any system. The other thing is uh, everything is, is validated and attested. So when a machine boots, we actually make sure that every single component in that system is exactly as it should be. That includes hardware as well as software and firmware. Has it been signed correctly? And if any of that is found to be incorrect, we won't actually allow the server to boot up. And then the final thing is we actually, we never built a command prompt. So there's no shell, there's no SSH. Um, and it was really, a, you know, at the time, I remember people saying, well, how are we going to run the system? Like, if I can't log into the system, and I think that's a mentality that, you know, uh, certainly other cloud providers still have is if something goes wrong, you have to log in and debug or get logs. And, you know, we just said to ourselves, well, that's not how we're going to operate. And so, you know, we're never going to be able to access the box. If we need telemetry, it's going to be stuff that we can, we can read off metrics that came off the machine or sanitized logs that came off the machine. Um, all APIs are encrypted and signed as well and deeply authenticated. And so from a security point of view, it really raises the bar 
um, on security and, and honestly solves a lot of the challenges that, that customers have. You know, Nitro also was the very early stages that ultimately led us to Graviton and memory encryption as well, which is another hugely important feature for digital sovereignty. And it's refreshing the moment that we pitch the Nitro value proposition to our customers. It's a kind of uh, eyes opening moment for all of them. Yeah. So I think this, is, this was another key fundamental milestone where we have taken the right decision following the right tenant to be digital sworn yeah. by design. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, maybe last question. Yeah. So again, you have spent so much time with me, with my team, yeah? Yeah. Talking to telcos, uh, the Orange, with Deutsche Telekom, with Telia, with Telenor, yeah. and I'm for, for sure forgetting some of those. And I have in mind the wonderful example of Deutsche Telekom T-Systems that last Mobile World Congress launched a fully managed data protection service on AWS. So the question is, uh, what do you think could be the role of telcos uh, within the digital sovereignty uh, area? Yeah. What kind of role? I think it's an excellent question. It's been a lot of fun working with you and the team. Uh, as you know, I did think you were crazy <laughs> when you started. I probably still do. But bringing the very <laughs> early telco ideas to me and saying, how do we solve these problems? And some of those are really hard challenges. You know, Outposts came out of some of those early interactions. And we've really actually driven a lot of innovation in AWS through telco requirements. And I think that's going to be an area of just incredible innovation for us going forward. Um, and it's really, it's sort of forced us out of our regions and into the edge, right, with local zones and outposts and all this other technology we're doing now. So it's been a lot of fun working with you. On the question though, um, you know, I, I think in, in many countries, one of the things we see from regulators and governments is that they want a local entity to be able to stand surety or to be able to attest. The other word we use is custodian. Um, and so, you know, Deutsche Telekom is a great example of that. Um, and, you know, the use case there was really key management. And, you know, what, what the regulator wanted was that a, a German-based entity had control of the keys and that it wasn't AWS managing the keys. And the feature we actually launched for that, which went public at reInvent last year, um, is called XKMS, which essentially means that Deutsche Telekom, in this case, with an HSM, can actually manage the keys, the key material, all the APIs that we need to use to be able to get an encrypted block back to do things like EBS encryption or any part of AWS, right, that requires encryption is actually going to a Deutsche Telekom managed system. Now, there's nothing, you know, Deutsche Telekom is a fantastic partner, but other telcos could do a similar thing and implement that. It's just a feature that we have where the key management can be done externally. I also think that that list, that's a great example, key management. There's going to be a list of other things. Some of those are going to be common amongst countries. Some of those are going to be specific to certain geographies and regulatory requirements. Um, but we look forward to partnering with telcos um, and have them be a custodian in these countries on behalf of AWS for the end customer for some of these workloads where that might be required. You know what, Dave? I think uh, I really want to thank you for um, the fun that we had while seeking the truth. Yeah. I think the beauty has been just to ask the wrong and the right questions but always challenging each other and listening to what our customers want Absolutely. and need. So really thank you for the thought leadership that you brought uh, in this super difficult area. I think, uh, I think we are digital soaring by design. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Thanks, Fabio. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you.